Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So please turn off your phones, have a seat. Hope you had a wonderful lunch. Thank you for coming back and joining us for the final portion of our conference. As you may recall, well, excellent. As you may recall, my name is Mariana Davidovich. I'm the Director of External Relations at the Foundation for Economic Education. And I will be introducing one of our favorite FEE faculty members. His name is Dr. Phil Magnus. He is a Senior Research Faculty and Education Director at AIER, which is the American Institute for Economic Research. He holds a PhD and MPP from George Mason University, sorry, and also a BA from University of St. Thomas, which is in Houston. Prior to joining AIER, Dr. Magnus spent over a decade teaching public policy, economics, and international trade at American University, George Mason University, and Berry College. Phil's work encompasses the economic history of the United States and Atlantic world, with specializations in economic dimensions of slavery and racial discrimination, the history of taxation, and measurements of economic inequality over time. He also maintains active research in higher education policy and history of economic thought. In addition, he has been published in many places. I will just name a few. <coughs> we have the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, Politico, Reason, National Review, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Now, he has a long list of accolades. We could probably go on and on, but I will tell you that Phil is probably one of my favorite people uh, when it comes to teaching economics and doing his research, and I'll tell you why. I had the pleasure of hearing him speak last week in Guatemala at UFM, which, is, uh, which held the Mont Pelerin Society meeting, and everyone was blown away by not just the fact that he does incredible research, but the way that he's able to put it together in a way that's comprehensible and relevant to all audiences. So please help me welcome Dr. Phil Magnus. All right, high expectations. This event uh, is actually a bit of a homecoming for me uh, because 21 years ago, uh, this coming summer, I was sitting in the same chair that y'all are. Not, not physically, I was over on the East Coast, but went to a Young America's Foundation conference uh, as a freshman in college, and it was life-changing. Uh, the speaker I was listening to there was a, a guy you may have heard of uh, by the name of Walter Williams and uh, who's unfortunately since left us, but uh, it was one of the first events where I decided I was going to study economics at. So I know that was probably longer uh, ago than many of you have been alive, but uh, you're, on, uh, you're at a great organization and a great institution, and I hope you take advantage of that and make this a long-term relationship uh, to continue to work with actually both of these organizations. I'm gonna talk to you today about a topic that relates several events in history, American history and world history. And the interesting thing about history is it has unfortunately become a, an extremely politicized discipline. It's very hard to study history in the academy because it's often used for uh, goals that uh, I would argue are outright uh, left-leaning and left-wing social activism. And yet at the same time, history is important because it defines how we look at ourselves as a people. It, looks, it defines how we understand uh, the events that are unfolding around us because we look to the past as a reference point for everything. And actually I can say that a little more succinctly if um, we quote the great economist Frederick Hayek who wrote a uh, fun little pamphlet in 1954 called Capitalism and the Historians. And what do you think the theme of that pamphlet was? Historians in 1954 did not like capitalism very much. Has anything changed? 
generally the same uh, problem that we're dealing with, although I'd argue it's become even more intense. But something Hayek pointed out in that 1954 pamphlet uh, that he wrote the introduction to was basically that the way we understand unfolding political events is not only shaped by the past, it's often shaped by incorrect, factually incorrect and false narratives about the past. That's a problem. How many of you think that the New Deal got us out of the Great Depression? Or heard that, uh, okay, we're in a good audience, not many of you think that it got us out of the Great Depression. Who heard that in your, your history class? That's the standard answer that's given. Uh, best academic research on the subject says the New Deal probably uh, prolonged the Great Depression. That's uh, Leo Hanian wrote a paper in the Journal of Political Economy, if you want to write down the citation, in 2001, that empirically tested and proved that FDR's measures actually extended the Great Depression. And yet, what's the narrative you see in almost every history textbook that's presented as the solution? So it's almost an affirmation of everything we're seeing in Hayek in his, his quote here. Now, I said this is a bit of a, whirl, a whirlwind tour of American history, so we're going to top, uh, touch on several topics. I'm going to try and focus it down to four major themes, and in those themes explore uh, different dimensions of history, what the historians get wrong, give you some evidence, give you some uh, figures, data, uh, some uh, stories even, that try to tie this together. And that's focusing on what we call the history of capitalism itself, or really the Industrial Revolution, what brought us into modernity. And we'll get the problem with slavery. Slavery is very hot in the news right now, and I think it should be for a good reason. This is something we need to study. Slavery is a, a massive violation of human liberty and was understood as such by people who we would now consider as the forebearers to free market thought. We'll get into that in a moment. We'll talk about progressivism and the New Deal, where that mentality came from and what it did to challenge an older liberal, but I say classical liberal, uh, view of looking at the world uh, that existed mainly in the late 19th, early 20th century United States. And then we're going to end on something that I think ties together the theme of this conference and that is the rise of communism. And really, I'm going to look at one particular figure in the rise of communism, and that is Karl Marx. Why is Karl Marx such a thing, and why is he considered uh, a viable intellectual figure today, even in the, in the, uh, the wake of the atrocities we heard about in the last uh, couple of hours that operated under his system? So, as I said, a whirlwind history of uh, the last several hundred years, and we'll start with capitalism. First, I want to get, ask you a question. How many of you, if given the choice to, be, to either live where you are today, enjoy the technology that we have today, your current status in life, that's option A, and option B was to live 300 years ago but be the richest, most powerful person in the world, like the king or queen of England, who would take option A? Raise your hand. Who would take option B? All right, so there's a little bit of a split in the room. And I asked this question with a reference to a specific queen of England uh, because, you know, 1700, roughly 300 years ago, who was the queen of England? Queen Anne. What is Queen Anne famous for? She was pregnant almost the entire time that she was on the throne trying to produce an heir. She had 17 children. One of them survived to the age of 10 and then caught some awful disease and died. These are things that were preventable medical tragedies that any simple hospital today could actually solve. She did not produce an heir. Let's go back even just 100 years ago. Who knows the President Calvin Coolidge? Good guy? One of Ronald Reagan's favorites? Kind of modeled several aspects of his administration on Coolidge. Most powerful man in the world, President of the United States in the 1920s, he had a son. His son lived at the White House and one afternoon went out to play a game of tennis. Got a blister on his foot on the White House tennis court. A week later he died. Why? The blister became infected and we did not have the medical technology at the time to save him. This was before antibiotics, something you can get at the local CVS or Walgreens. So ask that question again. Who would rather live today 
as opposed to 100 years ago or 300 years ago and be the most powerful person in the world? Who would rather live today with the comforts and technology of modern America? Almost everyone. Anyone still want to hold out and say, yeah, I could, I, I could be the, the king or queen of England? Yeah. You know, there are trade-offs here. There are risks associated with those trade-offs, though, so you've got to remember that. You get a common medical ailment in 1700, you know, there may be a 50-50 chance that you die on something that you could take care of with a trip to Walgreens today. But if you survive, life could be pretty good. What about the rest? Because there aren't many people who can claim the title of the most powerful person in the world or the richest person in the world at any given time. What if you're a peasant? Would anyone take that life up? See, no takers. All right. So for the common man, the common human being, life is a lot better today. Can we agree on that? So why? Argue capitalism. Capitalism made it possible. And I'll show you a chart there. And that chart depicts the estimated gross domestic product per capita of the world across human history, at least as far back as we can reasonably estimate economic output, economic data. And this chart is referred to as the great enrichment or the other hockey stick. It's not the global warming hockey stick we all know and hear about. It's the hockey stick of human economic development. And what do you notice in that hockey stick? Very, very flat. There's almost no economic growth from about the year 1000 for the next 700, 750 years. And then all of a sudden it skyrockets. Why? Why did it change? almost overnight. Why did they break a cycle that had been in place not only for the previous 700 years, but probably since time immemorial? If we had data going back to the Roman Empire, that same chart would look like a flat line all the way back to the ancient world. Very little economic growth, a lot of stagnation. There may be little peaks and troughs because some years are worse than the others. Some years are relative prosperity, but it's certainly not moving anywhere, and it's certainly not moving in a directory that's uh, bringing wealth to masses of people. And yet it takes off after about 1750, 1800. Well, there are several theorists, uh, economists study this question. They know the data's there, and they try to explain it. I'm going to try and briefly summarize what some of them have said. Uh, one of the arguments is put forth an economist by the name of Deirdre McCloskey, and what she notes is something changed in the mentality of society around the 1700, 1750, 1800 period. They started looking at certain trades that were previously denigrated, that were previously considered on the, on the periphery of society, things like merchants, bankers, traders, people who shipped things, and started seeing them as something to dignify, something to celebrate. Uh, you know, previous to that, uh, it was the lord of the manor and the feudal serfs underneath them. And those were the structures of society. And then, yes, there were people trading, but they were on the periphery. They were on the outskirts. As culture and mentality shifted, they were welcomed into society. And that breeds economic exchange. Economic exchange brings with it wealth. Industrialization follows. And it's off to the clouds. Joel Mokir, another economic uh, historian, has complimented McCloskey's thesis he points out that there was an emergence in the intellectual scene in the 1700s to 1800s uh, that basically birthed a theory of markets, a theory of capitalism, a theory of exchange, and brought it into intellectual repute. And then finally, the late economist Douglas North points out that institutions started to take form in new directions in the same area. Constitutions started to be written down in constitutions that protected private property, the rule of law, freedom of contract, established certain rights that would be respected. They allow the mechanisms for exchange to occur. Throw all these things together in a formula, and you have what we just saw on that last slide, the hockey stick, the acceleration. And this is actually playing out worldwide. You can break this down into regions of the world. Uh, certainly true of uh, the developed world, which is North America, uh, Western Europe, parts of Asia have skyrocketed, but you also see it in the developing world. You see it in Africa, you see it in Latin America, you see it in the Caribbean. Uh, similar hockey stick style economic growth. So well-being is improving. And yet, what do the historians say about that? Um, actually, my slide uh, 
seems to have stagnated. Okay, we'll get around that. Yeah, what did the historians say about that? Inequalities on the rise. Who's heard about the 1% versus the rest of us? All that's in the news? Yeah. Inequality has taken off. Uh, it sounds like we're in really bad times right now. Uh, the rich are getting richer and everyone else is being left behind. Is that true? I'd argue no, and in fact, I'm a, um, an empiricist. I, I work on this exact subject. And I'm going to point out, I'm going to walk over to the chart here to show you just a couple of events. This is the United States' depiction over the last century. So come over here and I'll talk really loud so you can hear. That's about the turn of the century. That's 1917, the first year we have good data. Here are 2014, so you see roughly 100 years. And the blue line, the blue line up there, is the one that the New York Times quotes that the news media presents. That comes from an economist by the name of Thomas Piketty. And he published this in a book. It's a very widely cited academic paper. And he has a very specific narrative. He says, inequality was high because of capitalism. Then FDR came along. See right here, this is the New Deal. And saved us all. And lowered inequality. It drops down across the mid-century. And then something happens here around 1981. And inequality takes off again. What happened in 1981? Actually, just discovered it sitting in that room right next door. That's the uh, the Tax Reform Act of 1981. The original copy is sitting over there. Uh, so he blames Ronald Reagan for causing inequality to to rise. This is the standard narrative you get. Well, you notice there's several different lines on this chart. The blue line is the one the media likes to portray. The red line and gray lines are two series that I've worked on directly. The red one is my own. The gray line is uh, from a group of economists at the uh, Treasury Department. And what we did is we reconstructed the wealth and income distributions of the United States across the entire century. And we're in the process of reconciling these two together. A uh, really neat project ongoing, but it's very math intensive to do it. Uh, the gist of it is, is that the Piketty Sayers series that the media likes to tout is all wrong. They made basic mathematical errors, and if you correct it, what does it do? It flattens it out, and it turns out there's no causal relationship between Ronald Reagan's tax cut and inequality taking off. There's no causal relationship between the New Deal and inequality declining. It's all spurious. Get into some of the reasons why in a moment. There we go. But I want you to consider some takeaways, because we've summarized, I think, a theory of capitalism in history. Basic takeaways, the average person today probably has a better life than a king or an emperor 300 years ago, all things considered. Certainly on the medical side, probably with the luxuries of uh, what you have in your home. They didn't have air conditioning back then. Life was very miserable without that. Uh, government oftentimes was in a situation of being a predatory entity, a king who ruled over all, and sometimes that king could devolve into tyranny. We've actually settled that down quite a bit, that uh, dictatorships, monarchies, autocrats of old are now frowned upon, whereas one time they were celebrated. Wealth over that era is neither zero-sum nor a static entity. It's something that actually exploded empirically from the 1700s onward, and that wealth has spread widely as society as a whole grew. And then industrialization, for the first time in human history, broke us out of a cycle of stagnation and brought with it gains that are enjoyed by almost everybody. And most economists who study this will all agree on these points. And yet if you ask the academy, you ask professors about capitalism, is it a good thing or a bad thing, they'll normally give the thumbs down. So ask the question why. Let's consider a couple challenges to it. The slavery question. Who studied this in your history class? Major, major theme and issue of American history, and it's one we struggle with as a nation. It goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson struggled on whether to include a grievance against the crown over slavery, and he was actually overruled. But Jefferson himself, as we all know, was a slave owner. Someone who saw the moral wrong, he inherited the institution, but he saw the moral wrong in it, and nonetheless he partook in it. I argue as a historian we have to take that 
version of history and understand it with all the complexities in it. Not to demonize, not to vilify, but to understand the complexities. But I want to talk to you about another area of, of the history of slavery that you probably have not encountered because it's not taught. So what are the conventional claims that are said about slavery? Who's heard that capitalism and slavery are partners? That they worked hand in hand? That slavery existed to complement capitalism or capitalism propped up slavery? They're, they're a little indecisive here uh, in some of the historians' claims that work on this. Some will say that capitalism made slavery successful and slavery made capitalism successful. There's a, a causality issue here if you haven't figured that out, but nonetheless, that's what's put forth. There's also a narrative told that says government action is what came in and ended slavery. It's like they wrested the slaves away from the evil market capitalists who were running the plantation system and getting wealthy on the back of the slaves. And anti-slavery abolitionism is therefore presented as almost like a labor upheaval, a progressive uh, aim onto itself. The argument I'm going to make, and I'm going to try and present some evidence for, for this, is that the history of slavery has been grossly misconstrued by people that work in this area. There's a few of them. Who's encountered or read the 1619 Project. Uh, that's the big thing right now from the New York Times. Uh, I've written a couple critiques of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a fun one. And there's a group of historians. They call themselves the New Historians of Capitalism. And what they do is they define capitalism as everything that they dislike, and therefore it's bad. And slavery is responsible for it. But I want to go back in history to a guy named Adam Smith. And this is one of the few figures you'll probably take away. You remember from your high school economics class. If you remember nothing else, you remember Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations and talked about the concept of the invisible hand. What else did Adam Smith do? Well, he wasn't an economist by profession or trade. He was actually a philosopher. He invented, basically, the field of modern economics but he was a philosopher that branched off from the study of ethics, morality, studying the world. And before he even started working on economics, he wrote a series of books and lectures that tackled other issues, moral issues in the world in his time, one of which was slavery. Adam Smith, if we know him today, we hear him talked of as the father, the theorist of modern capitalism, the theorist of free markets the theorist of non-intervention, but he was also an abolitionist. He opposed slavery. He wrote about the moral tragedy of slavery, and he was one of the first people to investigate the economics of why slavery was wrong. And you find this across all of his works. He wrote what I, I have labeled the first political economy critique of slavery, and basically what he was saying is that slavery cannot exist without a government enforcing it, without a government uh, propping it up, without a government intervening in the marketplace. And he says it does this in really pernicious ways, one of which is the slave owners get themselves elected to the legislature, to the parliament, to the Congress. And what do you think they do? Well, there's Adam Smith saying what they do right there. They strengthen the laws promoting slavery. They strengthen the laws promoting their institution and make it better for themselves. He's writing this in the 1760s. So he's way ahead of his curve on this. But remember this, Adam Smith, the economist, is also an abolitionist. Let's jump forward a decade or so after Smith wrote those words. There's a fascinating case that's handed down in the Crown Court of England referred to as Somerset's case. And who is Somerset? Somerset was the en enslaved servant of a merchant from Virginia that sailed across the Atlantic into London. And when he arrived in London, a group of abolitionists noticed something interesting about Somerset's condition. They said, there is no law in England proper that allows this man to be enslaved, to be held on board this ship as his uh, owner, Stuart's uh, servant. So they went to the court and they filed for a writ of habeas corpus, a writ to deliver the person of Somerset before the court to adjudicate his case. Very common part of English law, and we adopted it in our own constitution from that. 
Well, what does the judge do? He says, by God, the, uh, the abolitionists are right. There is no law in England proper, even though there was one in Virginia that allowed slavery to exist. Therefore, Somerset, you're free to go. And it's a very small ruling because it only pertains to one slave, one person. But he says something very important for our, our, our legal history and our economic history. It says slavery is, a, is such a severe condition that is incapable of now being introduced by courts of justice upon mere reasoning or inferences from any principles, natural or political. It must take its rise from positive law. Positive law, it must be passed by a legislature. He's saying that slavery to exist needs government sanction. He's basically affirming Adam Smith's observation. And in fact, we know this to be true, and everywhere that slavery has existed, it's dependent on the state to prop it up. That poster is a, uh, was posted around Boston, Massachusetts before the Civil War to warn free black people that had made their way north on the Underground Railroad into Boston that they could be captured by agents of the federal government and dragged back south into slavery. And there are real instances of this happening. 150 years later, we can look at it as economists. I'm going to briefly summarize one of the arguments put forth by a uh, more recent economist, Gordon Tulloch. He drafted this out in a memo, drawing inferences on Adam Smith's theories of uh, two centuries earlier, and he makes a few observations. He says, where slavery exists, it always requires heavy enforcement. If you don't enforce, what happens? Well, the people that are enslaved, they leave. They go away. They run away because it's not in their interest to stick around unless they're going to be beaten to death and forced to work. So what happens when there's government enforcement. Well, he says, first off, race or the color line becomes an enforcement mechanism of its own. And that's why we have laws that segregate white from black that emerge in Virginia and some of the other southern colonies. It's because if you see someone, you can tell by their skin color whether they're free or they're a slave. And that allows easy enforcement. He says, second, what do the legislatures do? They vote themselves agents to go around and police return fugitives. They vote themselves armaments, military installations to put down slave revolts and rebellions. These are massive expenditures from the public trough. And the slave owners themselves basically engage in a very corrupt and evil form of lobbying. They make the rest of the taxpayers of the entire country pay for it all. Now we can see why Adam Smith objected to this. This is an interference not only morally on human rights, it's an interference on economic rights. It's government subsidies. Well, Smith's heirs and successors are outraged at this institution with good reason. A couple pictures here. Uh, this fellow up in the corner, that's Richard Cobden, member of parliament. He's known for two things. He was one of the most outspoken abolitionists in parliament. And then the second thing is in 1846, Richard Cobden passed a law through the British Parliament that repealed something that was known as the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws were the restrictive tariff measures, mainly put in on the United States and other countries. Uh, it was the thing that Adam Smith had basically been campaigning upon uh, 75 years earlier when he's working on the Wealth of Nations. He says, these are intrusions on the free market. And what Cobden does is he unites the two. And he actually even built a, uh, a meeting hall in Manchester called the Free Trade Hall, and it had a dual purpose of hosting free trade, free market conventions, and anti-slavery abolitionist con conventions. Still exists today, it's a Radisson Hotel, but that was his purpose at the time. And then the painting here, this is a really interesting one. This is from the anti-slavery convention in London in 1840, and it's the gathering of all the abolitionists in the world. And I want you to remember this picture because it was where this convention was held. It was held in another meeting hall called Exeter Hall downtown London. It's also a hotel today. So there's a little bit of a theme there. But you see the abolitionist, that's Thomas Clarkson. Uh, he's the elder statesman of the abolition movement, is speaking to all the gathered uh, people on how to fight the problem of slavery in the world in Exeter Hall. Why is this important? Because there's an intellectual continuity from Adam Smith to all of these figures that are meeting in the 1840s and 1850s to fight slavery. And that intellectual continuity was recognized by this guy, uh, that guy, uh, Thomas Carlyle, 
uh, he, he did the, the Titanic thing. He found uh, uh, James McNeil Whistler, famous painting, Whistler's mother. He says, paint me as the girl in your painting. And that's what exists of Thomas Carlyle today. Uh, Scottish historian, very leading uh, intellectual figure of his, his era. Uh, Carlyle wrote a nasty little pamphlet in 1849 that sent shockwaves around the world. Uh, imagine if like a leading political pundit wrote a uh, column in the New York Times and it went viral. This is what this pamphlet was in 1849. And this is the other thing most people remember of their economics class, although they don't, they don't know the exact origin. Who's heard the term that economics is the dismal science? Sometimes referred to as the dismal science. This is where that comes from. So when your teacher uses that, you can correct them and point it out. The dismal science was a moniker attached to economics and the economics of Adam Smith in 1849 in this pamphlet, and I'll read it to you. Economics is not a gay science, but a rueful one, which finds the secrets of the universe in supply and demand and reduces the duty of human governors to that of letting men alone. Laissez-faire, let us be, let us alone. Carlyle objects to this, and he objects to it for a very specific reason, and you get it in the next paragraph. He says, the economists have joined hands with what he calls Exeter Hall philanthropy, a reference to that meeting hall. And under the dismal science led by the sacred cause of black emancipation or the like to fall in love and make a wedding of it. And he says all horrible things will happen because the economists have united with the abolitionists. Economics is deemed the dismal science and particularly free market economics is deemed the dismal science because it sought to abolish slavery. Something you probably won't see in a history book, but there it is from the quotes. Adam Smith and his heirs sought to abolish slavery, and those who favored slavery thought this was a dismal outcome. Kind of a weird take on, on how economic sciences worked, and yet that was the story. This jumped across the Atlantic, was picked up by the radical slave owners, and uh, some of their uh, more vocal pamphleteers. One of them was a fellow by the name of George Fitzhugh. You see here, and he's going to tie us into some of our other themes about where communism fits into here. Because Fitzhugh was a self-described socialist. And he wrote tracts and pamphlets in the 1850s defending slavery because he thought that slavery was, and I'll paraphrase him here, the most perfect form of socialism that had ever existed in human history. Why? Because there was a provider and there were workers, and the workers were all equal in their work on the plantation. And they were cared for by the plantation master in his mind and organized economically according to a plan, according to a dictate. And Fitzhugh actually writes these pamphlets. He, says, he looks at the socialists in Europe at the time and says, uh, all of you f fools are, are, are trying to achieve socialism through labor activism, but you're missing the key part. You should look to the United States. We've perfected it. It exists on the plantation system. We need to export that worldwide. Pretty horrifying stuff. But he also looks at Carlyle's denunciation of the dismal science, and there's some passages from him. He says, my only quarrel with socialism is that it will not honestly admit that it owes its recent revival to the failure of universal liberty and is seeking to bring about slavery again in some form. Vladimir Lenin would have loved this guy had they been friends and existed at the same time. What else does Fitzhugh say? He says, the person, the only thing that's standing in the way of universal slavery is laissez-faire, free market economics, the descendants of Adam Smith. And he says we should toss the papers and doctrines and books of Adam Smith into the fire because they are at war with slavery. Pretty horrifying stuff. Fitzhugh is also important because he discovers something we'll talk about in a moment, a doctrine referred to as surplus value theory, which if you start to study Marx in college, you find out that this is the core building block of Marxist economics. Fitzhugh discovered it about a decade before Marx on basically the exact same terms. He said that basically the wage earner, the wage laborer, is being exploited by the factory owner, the owner of capital, and the value of his production is taken away. And slavery will correct this because it brings it all internal onto the plantation. 
So really horrifying stuff. Anyone ever heard of Fitzhugh before I mentioned him today? He used to be taught all over the place because he was the antithesis of Frederick Douglass, antithesis of William Lloyd uh, Garrison, the major abolitionists that we hear about. He actually debated them and uh, was recognized by them as their main adversary. Yet he's fallen into obscurity today for political reasons. So big takeaways here. Then we're going to jump into a brief discussion of how progressivism emerges after slavery. First, I hope I've demonstrated to you that slavery could not exist without government propping up the institution itself. And we actually go to the eve of the Civil War. This is one of the reasons why secession was declared. If you read the secession documents, they're all upset about the potential loss of their subsidy, their protection, the loss of the Fugitive Slave Act, and expenditures on holding slavery in place. You also find the abolitionists are historically aligned with free market economics, overwhelmingly so. You find the pro-slavery theorists, people like Carlisle and Fitzhugh that we don't hear much about today, although we do know about the dismal science, uh, were either proto-socialists or some of them veered in what we call the precursors to fascism. Two sides of the same coin, authoritarian tendencies. And then we also find that anti-slavery was historically an anti-statist cause, an anti-big government cause, and yet it's been inverted in several of the historical lessons. So what happened? Rise of progressivism. Progressivism emerges in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. In large part, I'm going to jump ahead, because of one event. The assassination of a president. Not the only event, but it's a trigger mechanism. Who was that president? Anyone recognize him there? Four presidents have been assassinated. We know Lincoln and JFK. Who are the other two? McKinley and Garfield. And this is Garfield being assassinated on a, plane, uh, on a train station downtown Washington, D.C. Why was he assassinated? Anyone know? It's a crazy story. It's by far the craziest assassination in American presidential history. Yes. That is exactly yes. Charles Guiteau, who was a minor campaign functionary in Garfield's election, uh, he's, he's known on record, he gave one speech on behalf of Garfield uh, that was later discovered to be plagiarized from somebody else, and he put it out under his own name. And he convinced himself, because he was crazy, that uh, he was owed a job because he had single-handedly elected Garfield to the White House. So what does he do? He shows up at the White House and finds the Secretary of State and says, I'm here for my appointment. Can you make me ambassador to France? And the Secretary of State says, who are you? I don't know who you are. Uh, said, don't you know me? I, I won you the election by my campaign speech. This is obviously you're crazy. Go away. So he comes back and says, okay, well, I, I'll, if you won't make me ambassador to France, you can give me another another ambassadorship and they say no so he gets mad and he goes buys a gun he says I, I want the prettiest gun in the gun store because it's going to be in a museum someday and he shoots the president of the United States Garfield actually survives the initial shot and lingers several months before dying of infection again because we didn't have the full benefits of modern medicine and it was a very tragic end why is this event significant for progressivism because the aftermath of Garfield's assassination breathes life into the civil service movement. They thought handing out offices to former campaign workers is corrupt. It's not the way to do things. We can take the politics out of government and turn government into a science, scientifically manage it, if we eliminate spoils, the returns to uh, working on a campaign. So this triggers a whole wave in political science. We get this guy, Woodrow Wilson. He writes a seminal article in the 1890s where he declares that the science of administration should take root and overtake the science of politics, or the non-science of politics, really. And he says we can build an efficient machinery of the state that can solve all of our problems, promises all sorts of great things to deal with social ills. Well, what does he do? Uh, Wilson ushers in a movement that over the next uh, several decades upends the American constitutional order. 
We get in 1913, the 16th Amendment, something that the great uh, historian Frank Chodorov described as the root of all evil in the American constitutional system. That's the income tax. And it was initially a tax only on the wealthy intended to unchain the revenue system from the tariff. What it became was a tax on everybody in 1943, which will get us to our, uh, one of our future villains, FDR. Uh, progressivism also brought in moralizing amendments such as the 18th Amendment that prohibited alcohol. That turned out to be a disaster. Uh, brought us the Federal Reserve System, the management of the monetary system, and it changed the philosophy of the Supreme Court from interpreters of the document to, uh, to basically inventors of new legal doctrine that allowed unprecedented government entries and forays into the world of regulation, commerce, economic affairs. Why did they do this? Well, they claimed they were helping people. They, were, they claimed they were scientifically progressing society and solving problems that capitalism had created. What are some of the problems they thought they were so solving? Well, this is one that doesn't get talked about much. Eugenics. They thought that certain people were unfit. Uh, certain classes were poor, ill-bred, and hereditarily wrong unlike the elites themselves, and they had to be driven out of society through various measures. Uh, so you know, that's Oliver Wendell Holmes, Supreme Court Justice, one of the leading progressives, authored a, a case called Buck versus Bell in 1927 that declared that the state, the government, had the power to regulate who gives birth and who is not. John Maynard Keynes, who's heard him before? Economist, economic interventionist, is also the vice president of the British Eugenics Society. Uh, down at the bottom, that's Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, also an officer in one of the American Eugenics Societies. And that's Marie Stopes, who was her British equivalent at the same time. I'll even show you, there's a letter from, uh, from Sanger where she declared she wanted the feeble-minded sterilized by the state. And who did she mean by the feeble-minded? And I'll read this down at the bottom. It's actually going to be horrific. She says, we need to hire ministers on our behalf because we do, not word, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate, that we want to, yeah, she says, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and a minister is a man who can straighten out that idea before it occurs to any of their more rebellious members. It's a pretty horrifying quote. Founder of Planned Parenthood, everyone. She's a great progressive. John Maynard Keynes, leading economist of the progressive era, also chaired something called the Fifth International Neo-Malthusian Birth Control Conference. He said, let's scientifically plan humanity, and we can tie it to economic matters, including the problem of unemployment. He says, unemployment exists because there are too many poor people, and there are too many poor people because they have too many babies. That's the gist of it. These are all progressive heroes today. Turn to the fiscal side of things. Did the New Deal income taxes that were implemented in this era service the poor, serve to combat inequality? Well, the answer is actually no. What happened in the New Deal era, you can see on this chart, which I put together, this is the depiction of the number of people in what are considered the low income brackets of the tax system, the federal tax system. Starting in 1914, the first year that we have the income tax, these are the total number of filers, people that even qualify for the income taxes. Most were exempt prior to that era. Less than two million filers in each of these brackets, all the way up until it starts to change in, what year is that, 1933? And then it really starts to change about 1940, 41, 42. What happened during the New Deal? FDR shifted the tax system away from the rich and onto the poor. He expanded the tax base to where only filers were previously wealthy people. Now they shot up in number overnight. It moved from less than 10% of the population paid federal income taxes to over 90% of the population in FDR's presidency. Extremely regressive measure. And that's actually where we see the high tax rates. Again, we'll talk 
about where Ronald Reagan comes in. Low tax rates existed until FDR. He hiked the top marginal rate to upwards of 90 percent until Ronald Reagan, as we see in the other room, cut it in 1981, and it's been downward ever since. That's the legacy of progressivism, at least in its economic iterations. It's an attempt at central planning, and it's an attempt that undertakes some very brutal policies, although they're not policies that are the worst in the world at that time, which is what we're going to conclude on, Marxism. Main takeaways of what I want you to consider about progressivism. First, it was the product of a growing and increasingly corrupt government, not laissez-faire. It's not market failures they were trying to correct, but actually the injection of scientific autocrats and bureaucrats into the political scene. Progressive policies, unfortunately, unchained our government from many of its historical constitutional mores and constraints, which is why we've seen a growth in the state and a growth of the tax system ever since. Progressivism did dabble in science, but it was often a very ugly type of science, including eugenics, including centrally planned economies, and yet they were not the worst in the world at the time. The problem of Marxism, and I'll conclude on this point. Who is Karl Marx? Father of communism, right? What do we know about Karl Marx? Well, he's often presented as one of the great figures in the history of economics, one of the great figures in philosophy. When you go to college, you'll see his name everywhere. Uh, it's often argued that Marx can be disassociated from the Soviet Union and the other horrific regimes of the 20th century that were carried out in his names. Who's ever heard the, uh, uh, the slogan that's not true communism, not true socialism that was enacted in those regimes? Well, let's reevaluate that. Well, who was Karl Marx? First, I'm going to give you, give you a, a couple stats that may actually horrify you as you head off to your college careers, especially if you are not fans of Marx. Number one, Marx has the highest impact citation index of any major thinker in the Western canon right now, according to Google Scholar. He cited more than almost anybody. Second, Marx is the, consistently the most assigned philosophical reading on college syllabi in the United States today. These are, are come out of stats that uh, come from something called the Open Syllabus Project. He's assigned at two to three times the rate of almost any other major thinker, whether that's Thomas Jefferson, John Locke, James Madison, Martin Luther King, Adam Smith. They're all assigned about half the rate of Karl Marx. Third, as of 2007, this is already 13, 14 years out of date, approximately one-fifth of all social science professors openly identified as Marxists in the American university system. And this number has probably gone up since then if they were to rerun the same survey. And yet, ironically, if you point any of this out, you're accused of red-baiting or raising the specter of communism. Who was Karl Marx? Well, interestingly enough, a century ago, he was a nobody. So keep all those stats in mind as we go through this. We don't have surveys from that era, but we do have what other academic thinkers wrote about Karl Marx in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s. Quote, Alfred Marshall, who wrote the most popular economics textbook of the 1890s, he says, Marx's system is a system of circular reasoning shrouded by mysterious Hegelian phrases. Basically said it makes no sense. We could reject it. 1907, C. Violet Butler writes in the top economic journal of the day. She says she was asked to review Das Kapital, a new edition of it, and she says, who should tilt at such a windmill? Don Quixote tilting at a windmill was like going after Karl Marx. He's a nobody. Even John Maynard Keynes, even though he's very much an, ec an economist of the left, he writes in 1926 that Marx's Das Kapital is an obsolete economic textbook without interest or application to the modern world. should be rejected. What does this mean? Marx was a fringe figure just over a century ago. Why was he rejected? Let's get to the problem of Marxist theory. His book Capital comes out in 1867. It's constructed on something known as the labor theory of value. Value derives from the work performed. That's the gist of it. Simple enough, intuitive, what well, turns out to be an error. Why? 
because value differs from person to person. Who has a green car? Who has a blue car? Who would like a, a red car? Different people in different cases. The same person that likes the red car may not like a blue car. Same person who likes a pickup truck may not like a, a, a Prius. Why? We all have different tastes. And that means you'll be willing to pay more for a certain type of car than another. This, this pertains to almost anything in economic exchange. And what happens is value is actually derived from what economists call thinking at the margins and thinking subjectively at the margins. It's the decision you make at the moment of the exchange, not uh, a calculation you perform based on the labor that went into building that car. It's a long way of saying that Marx's entire system was built on an economic fallacy that was debunked only four years after his masterwork, Capital, came out. Capital was accordingly forgotten, and Karl Marx died in obscurity in 1883 basically unnoticed by anyone except for the labor radicals that he had surrounded himself with. Economists dissected his work nonetheless and declared it basically dead in the water by 1885 and then 1890 when the first economics textbook under Marshall comes out, he's dismissed as an absolute academic crank, a nobody. So how did we go from that to Marx being the most cited figure in all of the academy today, even though his rejection by the economists was early on. How did we go to that? One answer. An event happened in 1917. A follower of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin took over through a coup d'etat one of the most powerful governments in the world, the government of Russia. And then it promptly, as we have heard, expanded his rage, attempted to bring in neighbors, often forcefully, unwillingly, under the control of the Russian government. To use an analogy, I would go so far as to say this is, imagine a cult figure, and not just the cult figure, the cult leader himself, but an heir, a follower of the long dead cult leader, stepped in and took over the government of Mexico today and started invading all of his neighbors. Or stepped in and took over the government of France and started invading all the neighbors. That's essentially what happened in 1917 when the Russian government fell through manipulation and political intrigue to Vladimir Lenin. What does that do to Marx's reputation? Lenin declares a Marxist socialist republic. There's very little Republican about it. And overnight, he almost single-handedly rehabilitated and mainstreamed Karl Marx's academic reputation worldwide. So this gives us the answer of why Marxism spread so quickly after 1917. This is from my own work. This is using Google Ngram data to see how many times Karl Marx was cited before and after 1917. 1917 is the line here. Prior to 1917, he's very seldomly cited. After 1917, he almost instantly triples. I'll show you how far that goes in, in the next slide. Uh, what I actually did, though, is I used a statistical method here. I'll talk briefly about advanced econometrics. You don't have to learn this method, but um, this was run on a supercomputer that took 48 hours to generate uh, the equations that went into the dotted line here. The dotted line is a citation matching index that we call a synthetic Karl Marx. A synthetic Karl Marx means what if we took the number of times he's mentioned in texts prior to 1917, run computer algorithms through hundreds of other authors in millions of books in Google, and we come up with a path trajectory, a projection of what would have happened absent 1917. So we have statistical proof that the Soviets caused Marx to accelerate. There it is played out over the entire century. 1917 is right here. You saw on that last graph up to here, real Karl Marx citation patterns are in blue. What would have been had the Soviet Union never occurred is in red. Pretty shocking there. Why did the Soviets turn Karl Marx into a hero overnight? Well, they stirred up academic interest in this obscure philosopher that was supposedly the leader behind their scientific movement to reorder society and end inequality and solve the so-called problems of capitalism. 
but they also dumped tons of money into promoting Marxist economics, Marxist science. They funded research institutes. They funded the translation and publication of all of his works and letters and books. And they spread them around the world, often militarily. What did that do? It mainstreamed Marx from a fringe figure to the center of academic life in addition to spreading his political doctrine. And one of the direct implications of that is, quite simply, any Marxist today that says, no, I'm not connected to the Soviet Union, I'm not connected to Pol Pot, I'm not connected to Maoist China, I'm not connected to all these horrific regimes of the last century, is wrong. They are standing on the shoulders of a, a propaganda campaign put forth by the Soviet Union that almost single-handedly made Marxism viable as an intellectual movement in the world today. What does this mean for us today? Strangely, we're stuck with the relic of this system, the Marxist economic system, as a dominant philosophy on the far left, and it breeds time and time again attempts to repeat his experiment, to repeat the Soviet experiment, to repeat the Maoist experiment, to repeat the Pol Pot experiment. And every single time, what does it end in? What does it yield us? An attempt at central planning that devolves into misery, death, starvation, genocide. It's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, here are horrific human results that come from the Marxist system. But that is the world that we inhabit today, at least in its presence intellectually. And I'll pause for questions here. What I do want to ask you to consider and think about in looking at Marx's intellectual place, because as you go off to college, you will encounter this guy, Ask the question, why has he not been discredited by the track record of the last century? Why has he not been discredited as any proper thinker should be by the failures and abject human misery and the body count that emerged in his wake? And I think you probably know the answer to that. Thank you, Phil. We do have time for a few questions. Students, please raise your hand and give us your name and school. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm from Buchanan High School. My question for you is, why do you think people don't take the time to look at other um, economic figures from the past who constantly discredited Marx? It's a great and fascinating question. Why do people not look at other figures who discredited Marx? Well, who's heard of uh, Eugen von Bombeiwerk? He wrote a great little book in 1897 called, uh, that was attacking Karl Marx, uh, basically announced the demise of the Marxist system, and was seen widely in his day as having the intellectually superior argument. He actually found proof that Marx uh, probably borrowed, we call it today, plagiarized some of his work from other authors. Uh, in addition to being inconsistency in the, in, in the system. Yet he's an obscure figure today. Uh, we also know from the same period that Marx was writing, the 1850s and 60s, who knows Frederick Bastiat, the, the French liberal economist. Although he didn't engage Marx directly, he did engage the socialists, the contemporaries. And many, many of his, his uh, discussions pertain the same way. Why are these people not read today? Well, two answers to that. One is that they were read historically, and they had been seen to get the upper hand over Marx prior to 1917, and they were shoved aside. The second is we've actually seen an academic shift that has moved away from intellectual and ideological diversity and into ideological homogeneity in certain fields, especially the humanities that often, unfortunately, operate uh, under a, a very specific paradigm of thinkers, a very specific way of looking at the world, uh, which is, as we have seen, very heavily influenced by the Marxist system. In other words, that's a fancy way of saying many academics have not heard or read or understood anything else but that because the literature they study in college is entirely derivative of this one way of looking at the world. Uh, that's why we, as thinkers, part of our duty in, in life is to challenge that. I know it's, it's more aspirational than an answer, but uh, I hope many of you will go forth and do that.
Is it true that Karl Marx coined the term capitalism? No, it's not. He, he did try to define it. Um, there are different competing theories. It's known that the term capitalism was used at least in the 1780s and 90s, uh, and it appeared in different texts. It's hard to tell which term or which version of it took off. What Marx does is he tries to synthesize a very specific version that's tied to the owner of capital, the owners of, of the factories, the owners of land, and he develops his system based on that. It's really a, a neat fit for his system because his whole idea is that the owners of capital are taking value that's created by the workers away from the workers. They're exploiting the workers and they're using it to enrich themselves. And that's wrong and therefore the workers have the right to rise up and seize the means of production away from the capitalists. But it's a definition that's very fit to his, his system. Um, there are other definitions, I'd say a more modern neutral definition of what capitalism is. I'll go back to McCloskey. Uh, she, she doesn't like the term itself, but she says basically capitalism is time-tested betterment. It's improvement that comes about organically through competitive processes. And when you start thinking of, of it as something that's not designed, but something that happens through human agency and human innovation, it's a very different type of a system than something that's imposed by like a capital owner. We have time for one final question. Um, so my name is Joshua from San Inez High School. And why do, does humankind keep on trying to retest socialism if yeah. we've seen that it doesn't work and doesn't turn out? That is a tricky question. I see the first thing is, unfortunately, we've done a, a poor job of communicating the true horrors of the socialist system, even though the evidence is abundant. We've heard some of that evidence here today. It has not been discredited intellectually, and if you use a comparison, what happened to Nazi Germany after World War II? Nazi ideology was completely defeated, pushed back to the fringes. Something that was once a major political force just 15 years prior is discredited and pushed to non-existence. That should have happened in the wake of communism because of similar crimes and similar atrocities. It didn't, though. Why? Well, that message was never really uh, realized and, and, and attacked. And, you know, one of the weird things is, and you see advocates of communism throughout history time and time again, they always latch on to what they see as the ascendant regime that's supposedly doing it the right way this time. All the intellectuals that liked Marxism in the 1910s and 20s, they gravitated to Russia and said, well, they're doing it the right way. Then the Ukrainian famine happened. And they started looking around and said, well, we need to go somewhere else. Mao takes over China. Let's go to China. China is doing it the right way. All the intellectuals moved uh, uh, to defending China. Then we find, again, famine, massacres, atrocity, time and time again. The most recent one, Hugo Chavez in, uh, in Venezuela when he took over all the intellectuals on the left, said Venezuela is our next model. They're doing socialism the right way. Then under Maduro and also under Chavez, it collapsed into first tyranny and then starvation and then economic and political destruction. Now they're saying, no, we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, the new socialism is somewhere else. So it's a, a recurring pattern of always looking ahead for something that's aspirational and never taking credit or never re really having to reckon with the past, the wake of tragedy that they left behind them. Uh, and that's again, that's a story why we need to tell it. That's why we need to point this out. Because uh, you know, in my mind, uh, Karl Marx has no more intellectual value or credit to his name than, so than something you'd find coming out of like the Nazi era or fascism. These are flawed, disastrous authoritarian political doctrines that have left bodies in their wake and yet one is considered still respectable in the ways that the others are not. All right, thank you. One more round of applause for Phil. All righty, students, we're going to take a quick break before our final session. I know this weekend has already flown by, uh, but we want to get a group photo with you all first, please. So I'm going to have you all head downstairs, and we're actually going to take a photo right outside the door, uh, and then we'll be back here in our seats at 2.30, please. Thank you.